All right, good afternoon, everyone. Super happy to have you guys here. My name's Jeremy Hudson from Open Sky Group. Today, we're gonna be talking to you about how to create leaders inside your warehouse and how these folks from these organizations have, have done that themselves. And so it's gonna be a great panel discussion today. I'm gonna to start by getting straight through the intro. So like I said, my name's Jeremy Hudson. I'm a vice president of client services at Open Sky Group. Uh, we do WMS implementations primarily along with LMS and TMS. And so really excited about the relationship I've formed with these gentlemen and doing implementations with them. So without any further ado, we'll let them introduce themselves. Uh, we'll start with you, Matt. Thank you, Jeremy. My name is Matt Killo, Director of Logistics at Encore Wire Corporation. Um, I got my start at 18 on a forklift, much like the rest of us, and uh, have been in logistics in some form or fashion for the last 20 years. So thank you for, be for having us. Hi, everybody. My name is Anthony Grulon. Uh, I've been with Clemens Food Group for the last 13 years. Uh, 13 years ago, I started as a warehouse operator. I started with uh, case picking and other activities of that sort, uh, pallet picking and loading. Uh, there, from there on, I took uh, responsibilities in inventory. And afterwards, uh, I started working with a team that was doing our WMS implementation, and I've been their system analyst since then. Uh, I cover three warehouses across uh, two plants, uh, supporting them and working with uh, process improvements and report uh, creation as well. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jerry Spence, Senior Director, Engineering and Planning. Um, I've been in planning and engineering my whole career. Started off with the US government, working on Bradley fighting vehicles and drones for the Air Force, and then switched over to retail, which was a, a big shift. But always looking for process improvements, uh, always looking to do better designs, and Crate and Barrel's given me that opportunity to design our warehouses, uh, work on planning aspects of getting material from vendor into the US, and giving our associates the ability to pick and ship accurately, efficiently, and uh, not damage your, your goods showing up on your front door. So, thank you, Jeremy. All right, thank you very much, folks. So let's jump right into it. I wanna give you a general introduction of our topic, and I'll be the first to admit, this is a bit of a passion project for me. Um, luckily, in my role, uh, doing what I do for Open Sky, I get to visit a lot of warehouses around the country. I get to see a lot of different operations. Uh, and something I think is trending downward, uh, and it's disappointingly trending downward, is the creation of leaders inside of our warehouses through organic leadership training practices. The idea of looking at warehouse associates and understanding are these folks eligible to become leaders and what are some of the benefits of that. And so really what we want to focus on today is I've worked with these organizations quite closely and each one of them have a wonderful track record of forming leaders inside their operations and really taking advantage of that opportunity. So I really want to get their inputs around what's worked for them. Uh, how they're succeeding with this model, and why we think you should really go back to your operations and look for opportunities to do the same as what they've done. So that's going to be the topics we're primarily going to cover today, and I am really excited to jump right in. So I guess, first of all, um, I'd like to give everybody some relief, right? You are at a show where you will walk out that door, walk through these different booths, these different exhibits, and pretty much everything costs a ton of money. Right? Uh, <laughs> I don't think there's much ways to sugarcoat that. There's a few bargain items out there, right? But everything we're looking at here at Promet is a major investment, except for this idea, right? And I'm not selling it to you. This is an idea strictly around investing in your talent, investing in your people. It's a paradigm shift, potentially. It's a change in culture. But it's not something where you have to go back and do a capital improvement plan and justify the expense. This is something you could take back. It's a tangible piece of advice, a tangible piece of methodology that you can start using tomorrow. And so that's really kind of the, the premise I want to at least establish for the sake of this conversation. And Matt, I, I want to start by asking you our first question today. Now, you've been at Encore leading that operation for roughly three and a half years. Um, when you came in, we were struggling with turnover, we were struggling with fulfillment rates, things of that sort, and you have made a huge change in that operation. Now, I, I'm not going to sit here and shower you compliments the whole time, but I know that you know we've seen reduced turnover at Encore. You've significantly increased your volume and throughput. You've improved your safety scores across the site. 
And I know a major factor, when you tell me how you did that, a major factor is you've promoted people to the right positions with the right experience. And so just could you give everybody a little bit more context around how you've promoted leaders in your operation and why that's so important to you? Sure. This is, uh, this is a topic that's personal to me, obviously, because um, like I mentioned, I was started on a forklift uh, when I was 18 years old. And so it, it took someone investing the time in me and knowing who I was and how hard of a worker I was to give me that chance, right? And so when it comes to making larger decisions later on when you're leading an organization, you, you have those experiences that helped you form your opinion and, and know what works, right? It's not me sitting in an office uh, making decisions having never done the job before. So that's what's helped me and the same thing that that they looked for in myself, I look for in people that we promote. They've done the job, they've done the job really, really well. Um, I don't think you get promoted from coming in and doing your job, yeah. right? You gotta be the best, you have to be a top performer, and then you get, you're considered for the next position. Um, but having done that and promoted those people that have done the jobs, they have a really good understanding of how things work and what works and what doesn't work. So that helps them when they turn around and have to lead their operation and then make those decisions for the people that are now doing the job they used to do. Yeah, no, I think, I think it's obvious, right? If I'm a leader and I'm asking someone to change something they're doing, do something differently, et cetera, having that background of, listen, I know what the impacts are going to be to you, right? I know that's how, how that's going to affect your job. Just gives you that better decision-making capability. Now, Jerry, I want to switch gears to you. Now, obviously, you're running a pretty large engineering team at Crate and Barrel. You make a lot of decisions around what's going to be productive, how it'll be productive, how productivity is managed, measured, et cetera. How, I, I, I know Crate, in working with them, Crate and Barrel, they've got quite a few leaders that have risen through, throughout the ranks. I know that you know, your DCs put a priority on really promoting those from those floor level positions upward. How has working with those individuals helped you from an engineering standpoint? It honestly makes my, my job easier. Right, um, you know my my experience is I always like to get my hands dirty, um, so I know I'll say 80% of the job, but it's it's the operators that do it day to day that give you those small insights that make my job easier because there's certain things they know that I don't, and they can add that value. So giving first of all the opportunity to be at the table as we talk about changes and implementation, so their voice can be heard, but also making sure all those thoughts are incorporated into our final designs is, is really important. And, and one thing I want to touch on too is it's as we work with these associates on the floor, identifying the talent also is one of the hardest things you can do, yeah. right? Just because you're a good doer doesn't mean you're a good leader. And it's, it's seeking out those attributes that will make you a good leader is, is very important. And it's very obvious as you work with these warehouse associates who can do that and who can't. And Crate and Barrel is lucky enough to hire really great talent, and we do do a lot of developmental things and investing that time into our teams and our leaders to make them better every single day. And I think that's, that's the best part, like I said, makes my job easier is we put the time in, we put the effort in, they know the business, and they, then, they get, then they want to and are willing to give that information back to the organization to make our changes that much better. Yeah, no, that's... That's great information, thank you. And so, Anthony, I want to switch gears a bit, right? Now, Anthony here is a bit on the, he, he's crossed over to the dark side. Uh, Anthony came from the ops, right? And he participates way more on the IT side now than he does on the ops side. He spends a lot of time working with the WMS, the YMS solutions, et cetera. So, Anthony, I guess my question for you is, Obviously, you started on the floor. Uh, when I started working with you during your WMS implementation, you were fresh off kind of, you know, coming from that floor level job and working on order picking, et cetera. Now, you know, you're really controlling the nuts and bolts of the WMS. And so how has your experience in operations benefited you when working in more of a tech focused role? Sure, so 13 years ago when I started there at Clemens, um, I didn't have, uh, college degree or a trade certification whatsoever. So it was just uh, that young guy that wanted to do a good job, you know, day one and get a good impression. So um, learning all the tasks uh, that were around in the warehouse, so about year five or so, um, 
coming into that implementation, uh, uh, taking all that knowledge and uh, helping out our team with either uh, gathering requirements, uh, explaining or talking with our consulting team also in their own language, basically like this is what I do, this is how we do our processes, uh, became a much easier thing uh, to go through. And not only taking that knowledge of uh, the operation itself, but you get more technical and start doing uh, projects with other uh, areas of the business. So after our WMS implementation, for example, uh, I was recruited to help with the uh, ERP implementation and afterwards our, our plant uh, startup in Coldwater, Michigan. So all these things that you come to the table to discuss with other areas of the business keeps that uh, knowledge uh, of the business itself in, in growth. Yeah, no, that's, that's good information. And yeah, that's, that's, that's it's something I want to make sure we highlight, right? Anthony participated in an ERP implementation as well. This doesn't strictly limit you to warehouse management technology. Having that kind of input right, all the way down from the operations side of your business up into the ERP makes a difference as well. That's important to emphasize here. So no, that's good information. So Jerry, I want to start talking through some of the benefits associated with this. Now, I think you're probably the most fit to talk through some of the cost benefits that Crate's seen from taking this leadership model. So can we hear more about what cost benefits we've seen, what cost benefits others would expect to see? Yeah, the first I'll say is engagement. Right, keeping your employees engaged is, is a huge part of productivity for me. Right, They take passion in what they do, they take pride in what they do, um, make them better employees, they provide better feedback, they provide better safe working environments because they treat where they work like their house. When you, when you treat them with the respect and you invest in them, they invest back. It's not a one-way street, it's a two-way street. So what we've seen is better morale, our retention has dropped. Um, we've seen just happier associates, um, and it's, it's funny when you think about just happy people work better. They're, they're nicer to be around, it's just they, they smile. Um, you know, it's not the heads down like, oh, I'm just here to you know, punch in, punch out. It's, it's a family atmosphere, and you bend over backwards for your family, right? You pick up the slack when someone's not performing, you coach, you counsel your peers. It just creates a, a very holistic environment where everyone wants to do better. Um, and it's, it's immediate too. It's absolutely so quick. As soon as you just make that time and start the investment process, it's a huge shift quickly. And I know it can be tough making that initial investment, finding the time as leaders. We're all very, very busy. There's tons of stuff on our plates. And then, you know, the last thing you look down is like, I got a touch base for an hour. It's like, how, how, what are we going to talk about? I got so much other work to do. Um, but it's, it's worth every second of the time you put into them because they give it right back tenfold. Um, and it's, it's great to see just the interactions on the floor, the highs, the how are yous, learning about their personal lives, all those things matter. And they want to stay with the organization. They want to move up. They want to invest back, as I was saying. So it, it's, it's quick and it's easy. It makes HR's life a little bit easier, yeah. right? But uh, it's, it's well worth the time and effort. Well, no, and I think that turnover is a key highlight as well. I know we mentioned Matt's improvements around it, but just having that investment in, made in you, right? It makes you stickier to stick around, but then you get a second benefit from that as well in that you know, they're going to implement processes, these new leaders that are engaged, that like you said, are you know, very cognizant of the business's success, they're gonna turn around and make process changes that benefit their employees who will be less inclined to leave as well. And so from a turnover reduction standpoint, it benefits you in two ways. Your leaders are turning over less, but then also your employees that are reporting up to those leaders are turning over less as well, which I'm not sure if anybody's caught on to that. There's, there's quite a problem with turnover these days in warehousing. I'm not sure if anybody's reading the news. Um, but yeah, stay, stay caught up on that. There's quite a bit of turnover problems in the operation. This is a huge way of fixing it without implementing any major uh, changes to your warehouse. So just important yeah. to note that. And, and Jeremy, um, I'll, I'll, one thing I'll chime in yeah. on that with the turnover as well, and you know, being the engineering leader, um, is productivity too. Yeah. You know, turnover is a, you have ramp up plans, right? At Crate, we go, you know, 60, 70, 80. I mean, it's just weeks and weeks and weeks of ramp up. All doing the right things, right? You're coaching, you're counseling, they're learning the business. So as we also talk about turnover and this engagement, the longer associates with you, the more time that I'll say you have your uptime, right? Your direct time, they're actually producing widgets is there. I'm not losing four to six weeks of downtime as, an, as a new associate from the street walks in my building. They are there the full time, they're working, producing at the rates we expect. 
um, which then in turn gives me more output every single day. So Matt, I want to switch here and say, you know, Jerry talked through a lot of great benefits. Why don't we see companies adhering to this more? Why do we think it's trending in the opposite direction? Why isn't everybody doing this already? The, the quick answer to that is it's, it's extremely hard work. And if you don't have other areas of your operation running the way that they should, the amount of people that you need, the people in the right places, then you don't have time to do this, right? And if you don't, we all heard, if you're working in the business, you don't have to work, time to work on the business. This is a direct correlation to that, yeah. where you have to, and Jerry spoke to it, have to spend a ton of time to make the time to invest in your leaders, identifying those that are next, and, and who wants to do more in your operation. So uh, it, it's just that. It's a ton of work. It's work outside of your eight to five. It's, it's uh, developing relationships. It's, uh, you know, for me, our culture is extremely important to us at Encore. So we invest in our people more than anything. I make time for my team before I do anything else. So before I'd answer an email, before I, I make sure that those things are taken care of. Um, but the investment into your people is what will make your job a lot easier. Yeah, and I think culture is the key word there, right? I, I think you do have to have a culture that's really rooted in focusing on your employees, focusing on growth, focusing on opportunities for those individuals. And luckily that's something all three of these organizations have gotten really, really good at honing in on, right? But I think you have to go back and question your culture, question how you're focused on culture and really growing your, growing your talent pool organically. And Jeremy, now, again, yeah. I add something uh, with what Matt was referring to also, that uh, many organizations don't realize that uh, you have people that have been there five, eight, ten years, and if they walk through the door, they're taking all that knowledge with them, which yeah. is very difficult to just uh, plant somebody in, and they're not going to learn that ten-year experience in two weeks. It's very difficult. Uh, so take that in consideration as well. Uh, when it comes to that. And there's a cost behind that too. That, that next person that's external, uh, they might not last that long as you would think. And that's another cost that uh, some, some companies don't uh, take into account. Yeah, no, it's important to, to call that out. Now, I will preface, not every person in your warehouse is a leader, right? We've said that already. Your top performer may not be your top leader. Your top you know, a picker may not be your top supervisor. That doesn't necessarily correlate. But, Anthony, I think you're in a unique position to tell us what we should look for uh, in these individuals. So if I am going back to my warehouse after this presentation and I'm saying, you know what, I do want to put an increased focus on this. I want to shift my culture. I want to reduce my turnover, right? What are the things we should start looking out for in, in our associates to help us better identify candidates for this? Um, you know, some of the, sometimes what we uh, are in our teams uh, looking for that next leader or We've seen people that are um, constantly giving suggestions as well that are for the um, best interest of the organization. And we don't realize that until they're, they leave or they, they try to switch a department. Uh, and, and with that said, uh, why don't we go back to our, to our areas of focus, uh, let's say warehousing in our point, and, and check those folks that have been uh, applying for internal positions and, and let's check what was missing for their interview? Like, why didn't they get that position? Is it something that they needed as far as a skill set? Or is it a personal improvement? Uh, so I, I can say that for myself because the first time I applied for a supervisor role, I did not get it. But I knew exactly what was going on. I needed to do some uh, self-improvement as well. Uh, also, um, there were other skills that needed to be developed as well. So it wasn't uh, from the first time that, oh yes, I, I could be a supervisor. So, no, absolutely not. It took me three, four times applying and coming back to, uh, and reviewing exactly, okay, what is missing? Um, so just to point that out, that it's, it, it's important to look at after those folks and if they do need some skill sets that is uh, something that we can offer them, um, let's try to help them out. Yeah, and I think another focus area as well is it should be those folks that show a natural curiosity towards things, right? Those individuals that 
don't simply want to know why did the system tell me to do it this way, right? That don't simply want to know why did I have to go over there. The ones that actually say, hey, can I, can I actually see that, right? Can I look at that? I mean, I know that something that comes naturally to some individuals is that curiosity that digs them down to that next level where they'll start really looking at that a little bit more intimately. They want to understand it more, right? I, I think some of us may consider that an annoyance on the surface. I'm a systems guy. I know I do occasionally. I'll admit to it, right? Fault of mine. But I, I think you have to learn to emphasize like the, 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 the benefits of that, right? Someone that actually does want to dig down, pull them over, right? Let them look over the shoulder on your screen. Yeah, so we have this configured. It's looking at this attribute and that attribute drives it over here, right? And they'll learn, okay, that's why it's doing that. You've got some other individuals that are gonna look at it and go, okay, whatever, right? But you've got some folks that naturally wanna, okay, well, why is that value off? How do we get that fixed? What do we need to remeasure? Why is it length versus width? Just simple curiosities like that can oftentimes help you really identify those that would, that would you know, potentially be adequate for that next level. And then I know technology even, I would emphasize, you know, Anthony, your skill set has led you towards more of the tech world. Something I look at in some of the employees we have is the, the folks that are interested in gaming, the folks that are interested. I mean, so many folks are kind of amateur coders now and things like that on the side. It's important to solicit that information and, uh, and know what folks are interested in as a hobby. That might very well qualify them for a future position. I know one of my, uh, Matt's top leaders in his warehouse uh, drives drag racing cars. And last summer, he took the whole thing apart and put it back together. That's a great example that can, someone that can probably figure out an operation pretty well. Someone that's capable of that disassembly, reassembly. They've got the patience for it. You know, they've got that skill set. That's something, you know, it's just worth noting. Keep an eye out for those types of qualities. That's not to say you should only hand, uh, hire drag racing drivers. I, I don't think that's probably an adequate model, but uh, those types of hobbies help you really identify someone's skill set and their, their knowledge level. It's a good thing to know. Um, okay, so let's, let's move on to this one, Jerry. I wanna switch gears here again, and we are at Promat, for those of you that forgot, right? I think it's plastered somewhere up here. Um, so a lot of folks in this room are gonna look around and go find an ASRS system or a robotic system or something like that here that they think is great for their operation. Now, how can we leverage folks that have operational experience, right? How can we leverage them in some of the decision making uh, that comes out of the ProMat event? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you the way I'll, I look at this, right? As, as Jeremy said, there's a ton of organizations here, a ton of new technology. And, and my job is, I'll say, to take 100 vendors and narrow it down to five, right? So I'm, analogy I gave Jeremy earlier is I'm HR, I have a new position open, I take the thousand resumes I get and I present him with the, the five best. And that's how I look at this show for me and what I would do with my ops team. So I've been here, I'll be here two days, operation shows up tomorrow, right? So I vet as much as I can and then show them what I think is best for the operations for them to get, you know, I'll say the last 10%. I get us 90% 90, 90 there, and they give me the last 10%. Going back to operations involvement in the technology they need to use is crucial. I'll just say my biggest number one rule why, buy-in, right? Like I said, I know 80% of their job. I don't know 100%, I'll never know 100% because I don't do it day in and day out. I need their buy-in for the solutions because if I don't get that, it's just gonna be an uphill battle the whole way through. So my role is to eliminate the noise and really focus on what will get us what we're looking for, either throughput or productivity, cost reduction, right? And setting those goals up and those pillars to begin the, before you show up is how I, how I leverage their, their skill set in the show. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good call out. So, so yeah, no, I think that's important to note. So guys, I, I wanted to kind of walk you through, right? We've talked about the concept, we've talked about the benefits of the concept, but Matt, I think the, the next part's gonna fall on you, so no pressure. How do we put this in action, right? If I'm loving everything that's being set up here, if I think I'm getting a lot of great information out of this panel, I wanna go back to my warehouse, I wanna to talk to my leadership, or I wanna you know, cascade this message down to my operations leadership, what do we need to do? How do we enact this? How do we start really putting a focus on growing leaders? Sure, and I'll, you know, in my experience, I've, and I'll go back to other operations where I've struggled in the past, I didn't have a plan. Yeah. I knew I needed people, but I didn't know where I needed those people and how I needed to use them. So today, I have a specific plan on what positions that need to be filled, what kind of person I'm looking for, and then I kind of go to the operation and look and see who's top performer, who is wanting to do more, 
Um, and it gives them a lot of uh, skin in the game where they go, hey, not only do I know what I'm, why I'm doing this, but I'm also doing it to advance my career potentially. So um, I think that's important. You know, I identify good people and who I think is going to, to help us in the operation doing the right thing. The very basics of, of who people are and then giving them an opportunity. Um, you know, there's several people out there that I follow that, you know, they say the easiest way to, to trust someone is to trust them. And that's, you kind of give them their experience that they need and, um, and kind of let them go and understand that they may not do the job just like you did it, but they may bring something else to the table and find a different way of doing things. So um, I think that's the most important thing is just making a plan, going back and uh, you know, for us, as I mentioned, the culture is so big to us. Um, there's three or four things that we have to do to make all these other things happen. I think you got to offer a good wage to, to your people, um, offer them a good place to work and a good company to work for. And uh, so that's, if you have all those things in line, then you can identify and start developing the leaders for the next generation. Yeah, and, and something I've seen work really well, an opportunity to give people a chance to show out, has been creating committees, creating small kind of task force forces that can be led, right? Scenarios where, like even me, I, I, one of my first kind of, you know, positions where I was able to enter a conference room and participate was I was part of the safety committee, right? And it wasn't the most prestigious thing in the world, but it gave me a chance to interact with people outside of my normal workforce. It gave me a chance to kind of, you know, step up and, and you know, sit down with the big guys and talk about safety. But I mean, you know, it was fun. It was, it was, hey, we should make sure the fire exits are clear, right? Stuff like that. But even a chance for someone to show themselves there, just an opportunity to participate. It's, it's something most of us don't even think about. Put that on the bulletin board in the warehouse, right? Like, it's a sense of inclusion. It's a sense of participation. Things you can actually, you're given a forum to show out, right? I think that's very important. I think that, like I said, minor task forces, even if it's small improvements that need to be made, if we're gonna implement a different way of shuttling pallets or wrapping pallets or something like that, just forming a small group of individuals and having a leader to say, hey, I really want you to focus on these areas, it gives someone an opportunity just to show, hey, can they step up? Can they provide that voice, that guidance to other individuals? It's certainly beneficial in that way as well. So I, I, I think any chance we have to create micro committees, you know, opportunities for others to participate in those larger groups, I think it's beneficial. So that's good. Um, Anthony, what I wanted to ask you is, right, um, so We've talked about you know, how we can start implementing. How do we ensure success? And so you know, these individuals that are growing within our operation, what, what can we do for them to make sure they succeed and they're not, you know, they're not, they're not failing in that next level of leadership that we promote them to? Well, one of the things that we can start doing is uh, walk around the room and check uh, who has certain interests that uh, could fulfill uh, some skill sets in our, in our roles as leaders. Uh, it can be as simple as who's interested in learning a bit of Excel or something in that matter, right? Uh, those are the things that uh, get you closer to, to that door. Um, and once you do that and they show that interest, and it could be a list of things. Uh, let's say uh, over there at Clemens we have a, a portal with uh, op open courses that we can we can take. For example, they partner with some like virtual library or something. So why don't we start there? Uh, let's see what do they have a, a passion for as well. What are their hobbies? You mentioned something about the uh, self-taught coders, right? So we can uh, give it a try with that. Uh, sometimes uh, check who's out there doing uh, even outside activities of work like our are there leaders of their communities as well? Uh, and, and let's help them out too. Uh, those folks that uh, have care in their community as well, they will show the same type of care for your organization if they are tr uh, feel that they're treated as uh, an individual with respect as well. Yeah, and I think a word that we haven't mentioned yet is mentorship, but I think that's incredibly important. I know when I was rising up throughout the ranks in the warehouse that I, I started in, I was very rough around the edges, I'll admit that, right? There was probably some meetings where I should have stayed quiet and I didn't, 
Um, and I, uh, I took the embarrassment for that, right? But it really helped to have mentors throughout my career, and I'm sure you guys can say the same, that, you know, did provide that extra sense of guidance. There's certain things, coming out of a warehouse, there's certain things you just don't learn about how to participate in a conference room or in uh, other forums, right? And I'm sure, Anthony, I, I'm sure you can even say when you, when you got in that ERP room, those SAP folks, they're a little bit different than the uh, warehouse guys, right? It just, it takes a different, it takes a different feel, a different kind of behavior, a different way of suggesting ideas to really adapt to that forum. And I think any kind of mentoring helps to make sure that awkwardness is reduced, right? To make sure folks kind of understand the environment a little bit better in the ecosystem. But I, I think, you know, it sounds simple, guys, and I understand this isn't a, a groundbreaking idea, but making sure you emphasize and say it you're a mentor, right? You're going to mentor this individual. I'd really like you to make sure you work with them on their success. It's, it's not, it, in my opinion, mentorship can't be assumed, right? You can't just say, I'm gonna assume that person's gonna find a mentor and I'm gonna assume that person gives that other guy advice, right? It's gotta be more implied. It's gotta, it's gotta be more emphatic about, you are going to mentor this individual. I'd really like to see them succeed in this way. It's a great way to make sure these leaders are able to grow within your operation and succeed. Um, yeah, let me add to that, that, for example, uh, SQL coding. Uh, I didn't know SQL coding six years ago, but uh, being a liaison in between warehousing and our IT department, uh, I started learning how to do some coding, and what would I do? I would uh, do little uh, scripts and show them to uh, someone in our IT department, and, and they would evaluate, like, oh, yeah, that looks pretty good, but you can also improve by doing this or by doing that. And so taking notes from that, like now I'm doing reports. So it is something that uh, a bit surreal when you see the, your reports being used across the organization for, uh, from somebody that didn't code six years ago. Yeah, yeah, no, it's great. It's a good call out. Um, Jerry, my question to you here um, is how can people how can people make sure their partners are on board with this? So there's very few organizations that do everything alone, right? You're going to have consultants, you're gonna have implementers, you're gonna have all of these people sitting at these booths at ProMat, right? They're going to come and help you implement and help you kind of do these different operational improvement tasks. How can they help you with these programs? What can those folks take into account to make sure this is successful? Yeah, I mean, subject matter experts, right? You walk around these different booths and this is their niche, this is what they do. And, you know, as I walk around, my expectations are through their impl other implementations and their, you know, breadth of history, they're bringing that up, right? I think that's as, as I'm vetting, you know, different technologies and different companies, if it's all about me and my team and that's it, it's not going to be a good fit, right? It's about the inclusion from the beginning. Um, you know, I can say all my current partners uh, across, you know, what we're doing on now, when I first met them, it was, okay, let's talk about engineering, but when does, when does tech get involved? When does operations get involved? When does asset protection get involved? Like, they're asking those questions. Yeah. I'm not having to approach those. And that's how I know they're going to be good partners, because it's just not this one siloed effort. They're already thinking about the big picture which then takes the pressure off me and any, I'll call, I always call them hiccups, right? Down the road of, oh darn, we should have thought of this person. They're bringing that knowledge up front and coaching, counseling us and mentoring us through the process and through the projects. So for me, it's as you talk to these vendors or if you're a vendor yourself, make sure out of the gate they're already talking about the current partnership with you, but the bigger partnership with the entire organization and your company. Because as we talked about just you know, building a leadership up from the inside, they should be also bringing other leaders in with them as well. Um, to make sure it's a holistic view of every problem, because if you know, not everyone has a seat at the table, the problem's not going to get solved correctly, right? And, you know, if if it's just a conference room, it's not going to get solved correctly. You need all the individuals. You need to be on the floor. You need to be vetting ideas. You need to be doing all these things. And if that partner day one isn't saying those things, they're not going to say it day two, and they're not going to say it day hundred. They need to be saying it first. And so that's what I would I would say for this. This, this, this environment here is really make sure that that partnership is number one um, and they're including everyone out of the gate. All right, great. So we're 
We're about to wrap up, but before we do, um, I'd like to go through each of you and just ask if you wanted if you wanted the audience to take away one thing from this presentation, right? Again, I think this is a passion project for several of us, um, but if you wanted this group to take away one thing, um, what would that be? Matt, we'll, we'll start with you. You know, I spoke a little bit about that earlier, but it's, it's as elementary as making a plan, right? And going back and putting it on paper, what positions you need to fill, what identifying the right people that you need, and uh, really developing the relationships of those on the floor that are doing the day-to-day the, the -day task that want to do more, and right? And giving them, like we talked about, giving them more responsibility, and through that responsibility, you'll identify if they're set to be a leader or not. So. Um, it gives them more to shoot for, more uh, a, another reason to come into work every day. So it's just, just as simple as that for me. Good. Uh, Anthony. Oh, another thing that I wanted to go through, the, um, also when it comes to buy-in, uh, once you have somebody or a leader that's uh, homegrown in your organization, there's a different twist when it comes to doing uh, process improvements, implementation whatsoever. Uh, the other people from the floor actually see, oh, I'm working with Jeremy, and Jeremy has been here for a while, he knows what he's doing, so not to discredit like any person that come in from the engineering background, but there's another flavor of, or another era of trust um, coming from that. Uh, I would go back to, the, to our teams, um, and like I said previously, uh, check those uh, skill sets that are um, around the team, what is, what's missing, uh, what do they need help with, and mentorship, I would say. I agree 100% with mentorship. All right, Jerry? Simply put, make the time, right? Developing leaders, uh, homegrown, takes time, takes effort, and you have to put that in as a leader. You know, like I kind of mentioned earlier, as much sometimes as we get busy and, and feel, feel like we're drowning, we have to make the time, make the investment to those associates because that's what they deserve. Um, so for me, it's definitely as much as you want to cancel those touch bases because you got other things going on, you can't. You know, I'd rather work an extra 30, 45 minutes in my workday but give my team my time and effort um, than, than kind of ditch out on them and, and leave them hanging for an entire week. So as, I'll be honest, as much as my team hates me because I bounce our touch bases around all week making sure I can make the time, you know, I'll move them three, four times to make sure they get done, uh, they have to get done. So just make the time, come prepared, have an agenda, um, so they're also value added, right? Just talking about what they're working on, you should know what they're working on. You, get, you probably assigned it to them. So think about all those other things that you should be talking about, you know, accolades, feedback, their goals, right? Making them a better, well-rounded, you know, associate. All comes back to being prepared and making the time for them. All right, good. Um, so I guess I'll wrap up. I get a chance to answer this one too. Uh, this is going to sound cliche, so I'll warn you all, but if you're a leader in an operation, if you're an operations manager, a general manager of a DC, if you're you know, at the CIO level, the COO level, right, whatever you may be, again, sounds cliche, but you do have a chance to save lives. Uh, uh, sorry, change lives. <laughs> Holy smokes. <laughs> save lives. I don't know about that, but you certainly have a chance to change them, right? And I can speak from experience. I started in the warehouse when I was 18 years old, and leaders gave me opportunities I did not earn, that I did not deserve, that I had no justification in doing, right? But they took a chance on me, and it was great. I went from floor, floor picker, right, to an, a, a supervisor, and then from supervisor to dabbling in procurement for a while, and then back to operations management and up through the ranks. And it was all based on people giving me opportunities. And that's something I'm, I'm, I'm begging for you to do, right? Go back to your warehouse and look at those individuals because warehouses, we're flooded with new resources right now. Folks that may not have seen their lives going that direction. They've left retail for whatever reason, right? But they're now going into warehouses and they don't want to be seen as numbers. Right? It's not a numbers game anymore. Um, we should look for opportunities to highlight those that can overachieve, and we should give them those opportunities to rise within an operation because I think, you know, hopefully, if this served as nothing else, it's justification to show you that you can find leaders um, and, and folks that can make a difference in your operation by simply looking within and really harvesting from that talent that you already have. So with that, we've got five minutes left. Any questions our panel can answer? Anything 
that we can uh, we can answer today. Show of just raise a hand to fire a question away. Anything we can answer before we wrap up? Yeah. I don't have a question. Just a comment to uh, reinforce what you said about mentoring, and that is, uh, I didn't start when I was 18, but I'm also more than four years older than 18. So uh, I've mentored a lot of people. I'm just saying, I don't really have a question, a comment to reinforce what you've said um, about mentoring and giving people a chance, and that is that nine out of 10 people, for those of you who would like a mentor, nine out of 10 people, if you ask them, no matter how senior they are, they will say yes. So nine out of 10 people, you got nine out of 10 chances that whoever you ask, even the CEO, depending on the size of the company, they'll probably say yes. Yeah. If you thought enough of them to ask them, people want to help. The other one is, uh, those who ask for mentorship, those who stand out and say, I want help, or I want advice, or I want coaching, will stand out in the future. And you'll get noticed in the conference room, maybe in the boardroom. So uh, I'm 70, so I get to say that. None of you guys are qualified to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, other questions we can answer? Yeah. Can you yell out now? I can try to no, no, so. <laughs> You're going to need that. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. I'm Jane Greenwald from Green Manufacturing. We talked about employee satisfaction earlier on the floor. Can any of you all give just some great gold star examples of things you did to improve their lives out on the warehouse floor, just little changes or improvements in their working environment that we can make? Matt, you may have one for that. <laughs> well, you know, we talked a little bit about that. To me, there's three things that we really do. It starts with offering a fair wage for your market, right? and offering a great place to work. Uh, our facility, we just opened a brand new state-of-the-art distribution center, so I have that to give to our people, right? And then the third being a good company to work for. So when you give those things together, and then the fourth, you build a team around it, and uh, we do a lot of stuff on the floor with team building and uh, even, even in our startup meetings, or our safety meetings, we do a lot of team stuff, right? And it gives those uh, floor associates more to work for, uh, a sense of purpose, a sense of uh, family, like, like Jerry mentioned, um, and they enjoy coming to work every day. So I think that's what a lot of people want. Some of them want to do more. Some of them want it, uh, to, to rise up to different positions, right? But all of them want a good place to work and come in every day and enjoy what they do. So if you give them that, uh, the other stuff comes pretty easy. I want to add with that that during the COVID time, we kind of got adjusted to do a lot of video conference calls and not have like direct eye contact with people. And, and we kind of walked away a little bit of that. So I think it's important as well as uh, to pay attention to, to the people. Uh, and, and let them feel like heard, like they are actually paying attention to me, not looking at their computer, answering emails and stuff like that, right? That, uh, that connection is the word I was looking for, being connected with that person. That's good. All right, other questions? You've got one minute left. Rapid fire, yeah. Yeah, I'll repeat the question. The, the question was, what challenges come along with mentorship? Is it spreading one too thin, things of that sort? But what are the major challenges that come with mentoring? Yeah, I, I can start. So um, it, I actually got sh shot down for a mentorship, right? And I actually, the gentleman who did it, I respect him more for it uh, because they were honest and open with me that they, they didn't have the bandwidth. So I think to kind of your first comment is, know what you can take on. Don't take on too much because the whole purpose about a mentorship is to invest the time and put the effort in. And if you can't do it, just be honest about it. That's the first part. Is that, is, what, did it suck in that moment? Absolutely, I was devastated because I knew it would be a great opportunity for me to learn. Um, it worked out later, it was about two years later that I was able to do that. But in that moment, it, it, it changed and I, could, I, I was sad, right? 
but I respected them for doing that because they knew what their bandwidth was and their job requirements and so on and so forth. And so I think that, you know, as you talk about spreading too thin and, and knowing what you can do, you have to just be honest with yourself and with that person who's asking. And if things get tough and things change throughout that, be honest about that too. And say, hey, I can't do it right now, or I need to take a three-month pause, or it's that open line of communication that hopefully you develop with that mentoree, where it's, it's that relationship, and you just need to be clear and concise and open about it. All right, so that brings us to a close. You got your money's worth today. That was the full 45 minutes. If you want to talk more, come back to our booth. We're giving away popcorn. Come on. 3575. So head over that way. We'll be giving away some popcorn and talking. All these guys will be here, so come back and join us there. Thank you.